Hello, everybody. It's my great pleasure to invite our second um, speaker today, Dr. Maria Neira. She's a, a national, a Spanish national. She's a physician by training, uh, specialized in endocrinology and metabolic diseases. She has varied experiences from being vice minister of health to the head of various agencies. She's been for the past years uh, the head of the Department of Public Health, Environmental and Social Determinant of Health at the uh, WHO, and it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, her talk. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and uh, I was already very, very excited to be here, to have the opportunity to be in front of uh, such an incredible audience, but after Gina's speech, I feel even ready to go to any country around the world and convince them to change legislation and to go on something against pollution immediately. So you give me another speech like that, and I don't know what I will do. So careful with your dose of uh, caffeine and uh, stimulus, because Really, I'm, I'm, I'm super happy to be here today, and particularly after the words of Gina. And let me tell you something before starting. There are a few days in life when you work on public health where you have in front of you a clear opportunity to transform the scientific knowledge, the evidence, the evidence into policy. And one of those opportunities were in Geneva at the World Health Assembly, we were about to present something on air pollution, and Gina came to Geneva, and we called you. I didn't know her at that time. She was one of the most powerful women in the world, but so what? We were inspired, so we approached you. She was in Geneva attending, I don't know which meeting, and we said, we need you at the World Health Organization. And she says, what for? We need you to talk on air pollution and climate change and health. We have all the ministers of health here, and they are not convinced about the role that the health minister can play in something like uh, air pollution or, or uh, I mean, climate change or air pollution. They recognize the problem, but they don't really see what is their role. Gina came, she told to them on a similar way that she did this morning, and we have a resolution on air pollution, we have a roadmap on air pollution, and we have now 194 ministers of health really convinced, or at least I want to think that they are very much convinced that they want to do something about air pollution and climate change. So thank you very much, Ina. That was really you. And there are many in WHO who are still very, very grateful for what you did that day on convincing not only the ministers of health, but even our own administration because they were not very convinced whether WHO should move into something that was not really our comfort zone, not from a scientific point of view, on that we have all the evidence, but maybe on pushing the health sector into something where they felt a little bit less comfortable. And today, I think we can say that thanks to the, the scientific evidence that you are producing every day, we have policy recommendations and we have changed some things Still very little because we want to do much more, but we have a good challenge in front of us. Um, I will not so nice as Gina and not uh, having a PowerPoint presentation. I have to have it. But I hope that will be something that uh, at the end of the presentation you can have as well some ideas and how we take this call for action and where we use our evidence to generate more policy changes and transformation in all of that. By the way, you have been my coffee. In this part of the world, you still call coffee something which is a hot beverage. But believe me, if you were married to an Italian as I am, you will recognize that this shouldn't be called coffee. It's something else, but a real coffee. <laughs> but you were my coffee of the day, so thank you for that. The rest is a hot beverage. OK, we are about to discuss soon, next year, at the World Health Assembly, in front of all of those ministers of health, the new WHO Global Strategy on Health, Environment and Climate Change. So this is, again, a very good opportunity to be mobilized as this group and many other networks around the world and push for something that I fully agree with, Gina. This is all about common sense. This is all about basic, pure public health that we are trying to promote. Let's talk about how to protect our health and how to promote it. And maybe this is the language that we need to use more and more from now on it. Well, what are the facts? Those are the facts today. 
Wherever you travel around the world, you will see people in the middle of this uh, situation. This is the reality, protecting yourself with a little mask or thinking that you are protected with a mask. Exposed to this situation, there are even children in some countries around the world that they don't know that the sky can be blue. And, you know, they think that the sky should be this color. There are people every day still carrying water if they want to drink, and still thinking that there is not such a facility as open a tap and having the, the, the water at home. There is people for which sanitation is a fancy word and they don't know what it is, and they still need to use as something very sophisticated, this type of latrines in the base of the occasions. Of course, this is taking now a lot of interest by the media, sometimes in the good way, sometimes in the very negative way, but it's there. Our data is there. The terrible figures are getting there, and probably, little by little, we are taking the right approach in terms of communication. Until now, I think we did something wrong on communication. We were talking about the apocalypse now, and we were less talking about the incredible opportunities, particularly in terms of economic development, social development, and public health that this change and this transformation could bring. We were try, uh, trying to make people afraid of everything, uh, paralyzed even sometimes, and even not reacting because they didn't see the way they would contribute. And one of the ways of contributing is by putting a lot of pressure on their politician to clean the air for their children and not for the planet. I fully agree. We need to change completely the way we are communicating. And this is the reason why we need to change. We have this incredible challenge in front of us now. We have 25% of the global burden of diseases linked to exposure to environmental risk factors. How can this be possible? How can this not get in the newspapers and the front pages of all the newspapers around the world. This is an incredible message, because if we put it in positive, we say that we could reduce by 25% the global burden of diseases. We, we do something as simple as increasing access to safe water or cleaning a little bit the air we breathe. So this is an incredible number, but it still is not attractive enough attention. When you look at those diseases, what are the, the environmental stressors that are causing this incredible program, problem? Well, of course, climate change, and climate change will be even exacerbating. But it's about air pollution. It's about still something that shouldn't be with us anymore, which is inadequate access to safe water, sanitation. The problem of chemicals, radiation, the way we do our agricultural practices, the way we live, the way we are promoting our society is causing us all of this damage instead of being an opportunity to create something much more powerful and positive. And when you look at the diseases caused by those environmental risk factors, people tend to think about diarrheal diseases because those are the most traditional ones associated with access, lack of access to safe water and sanitation. No, look at the number one, stroke. Very often in the media, but how many people know that the stroke is so much linked to air pollution, to exposure to air pollution? Very little people, they are starting to understand about that, and we are starting to communicate in a very aggressive way about that, but until now, people will never associate environmental risk factor with diseases like stroke, ischemic heart disease, cancers, or chronic respiratory diseases. This is one of the reasons why, if you look at the agenda on non-communicable diseases, which will get now a very uh, uh, a lot of interest by policymakers and presidents and head of states, air pollution was not included as one of the risk factors. It took us five years of fighting, almost physically, sorry to say that, but almost physically with some of our colleagues to recognize that air pollution is a risk factor and we have Plenty of evidence. What we were missing, the evidence was there. Why risk air pollution was not included as a risk factor? Simply because we still have a very medical, clinical, narrow uh, uh, approach to this type of disease. I'm a physician by training, eh? so I'm not criticizing. I'm one of those. So I'm, I'm one of those guilty on having a very narrow clinical approach when we talk about public health. Finally, the good news is that, yes, air pollution has been recognized 
Aleluya. Uh, this is the reality. I mean, when we talk about air pollution, WHO has been saying this, thanks to the, 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 the work that many of you are doing around the world. We are saying every day, nine out of 10 people exposed to levels of ambient air pollution above WHO's guidelines. And I know that many of you have been contributing to doing those guidelines, so you know very well what I'm talking about. The diseases, the disease outcomes, well, diseases that are affecting all of us and they are costing a lot of money to our health systems, to our countries. And this is something that politicians are not taking into consideration when they do fantastic estimates about how much it will cost to mitigate climate change. This has not been considered. This is one of those funny contradictions that we are facing every day, like the one on air pollution and non-communicable diseases. This economic argument has not been incorporating on the climate change debate. We have been looking at many uh, uh, options in terms of finances and a lot of production of documents on that. Have we looking at, have been, been looking at how much is costing our own health systems? Not in terms of health, but in terms of treating the patients affected by that. No, has not been considered. Hopefully it will be very soon. Uh, climate change, of course, we have been concentrating on climate change and we have been providing a lot of evidence, but when we tried to do something which was very logic, associating climate change to air pollution, because in fact, all the interventions you need to put in place to mitigate the causes of climate change will be generating, one of the most immediate benefic benefits will be the reduction of air pollution and therefore the reduction of the seven million premature deaths caused by air pollution, exposed to air pollution. This is all politics, this is all science. I don't know, this is the same agenda. So clearly we need to make sure that everybody understands that climate change is not something remote and is not something for the next generations and only for the planet, but is about our health. And this is the reality of the girls around the world. Then we talk about gender. This is gender. This is gender. These girls, I mean, almost half of the world population is cooking like in the Stone Age. That means that the girls are the ones collecting wood or collecting, you know, whatever they will use at home to cook. And therefore, of course, they are not going to school. So gender is not something philosophically impossible to sort out. Provide access to clean fuels for cooking at home. <laughs> the next day, those girls will go to school. And the next day, your statistics in terms of gender benefits will increase dramatically. So again, no miracles, no incredible surprises. These girls need to go to school, but to go to school, they need to be able to have access to safe water and sources of energy at home. Otherwise, there will be the slaves of water and energy forever, and therefore we will not sort it out that. The diseases outcomes, you know that very well. I don't need to tell you, but those diseases that are costing fortunes to our society and to our economies. Chemicals, no doubt chemicals are representing something incredible in our life, incredible benefits, but at the same time, the chemical industry is moving very fast and obviously the, 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 the scientific community cannot go at the same speed, but even if that, we estimate that 1.3 million lives are, are lost every day because exposure to chemicals that shouldn't be in the market. This is a very difficult battle. But still, if we put it on a public health sense, maybe we can make some gains. Very recently, I was attending the Minamata Convention when it was signed in Japan a couple of years ago, three years ago, and everybody, the environmental community was celebrating. Finally, we have the Minamata Convention. The convention, they were celebrating. I was not celebrating. How can we celebrate that we sign a Minamata Convention on Mercury 50 years after the clinical evidence was there? How can we sat be satisfied about something like that? Are we ready to do the same now with air pollution? No, another 50 years before is something recognized and taking uh, uh, people to jail because they were doing the wrong things? No, it has to be shortened and we will do it together. So we need to be prepared to do very strong things on legislation and maybe even more than that. Inadequate sanitation, I think the figures are dramatic. Uh, there is a call now for, for 
uh, uh, improving sanitation, and uh, I think it's something that, you know, when you talk uh, on, about public health, you still need to repeat those figures that uh, 2.3 billion lack basic sanitation. I, I feel really embarrassed. I think we are doing something dramatically wrong. And again, it's not because lack of science, because lack of numbers, because lack of evidence in all sense, economic, cost-benefit, cost-efficient, name it, everything is there. Still, we don't have sanitation. Healthcare facilities, 30% of our healthcare facilities do not have access to water and soap. And then we talk about infection control and we talk about transmission of diseases. Well, if you don't have soap to wash your hands, how can you call that a healthcare facility? It shouldn't be called a healthcare facility if you don't have water and soap at, and soap at least. Okay, that was very negative and a little bit apocalypsis, but um, let's focus now on something. Imagine that I have this Italian coffee that I am still hoping, hoping to have uh, later and uh, focus on something very, very positive. What are the opportunities? Are there opportunities with all the scientific data we have? Definitely, and one of the opportunities is coming from the Paris Treaty. When you look at the voluntary commitments that the countries made at the, at the Paris Treaty, if you look at all of them, you can calculate the health benefits that can be obtained from the Paris Treaty. That will be the, the, the next the public health agenda, probably the most ambitious ever. This is all about public health. The Paris Treaty is all about health. It's all about public health. If you implement the, public, the, 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 the Paris Treaty, we don't need to do anything more about public health. Everything is there. Everything will be protected. As I mentioned, our critical opportunity as well comes from the non-communicable diseases agenda. Finally, air pollution is recognized. Finally, there will be some interest about issues like air pollution, and it's not just about the behavioral risk factors. I mean, don't smoke, don't drink, have to uh, eat half of what you are eating now, you have to walk. That is extremely important. But there are things that uh, uh, is not just a behavioral. If I live in Beijing, I have to breathe uh, the air that is available. I cannot choose. So uh, there is, is more than a behavioral change. is a change in the, in the quality of the air on the city where I live. Uh, this is an economic opportunity. At the moment, we have in all of our governments, in all of our health systems and institutions, 90% of the resources for health, they go to health care. We treat the diseases. 97% of the funds goes for treating the diseases. And only 3% goes to prevention. And most of the, this prevention is secondary prevention, means is detecting an early detection of a cancer, for instance, but the cancer is already there. But we do not spend enough on primary prevention. And maybe it's good that it's not the health system spending on primary prevention, but this is where our role is to convince the energy sector of the responsibility they have on investing on primary prevention. The countries that will be selecting clean sources of energy, those countries are the ones that will be protecting health and will be generating more health benefits. So the investment now for primary prevention has to come from sectors other than the health sector. It has to come from the energy sector, from the agricultural sector. It has to come from investments at the urban development. Mayors need to invest on public health, even if they don't call it public health. This is where the benefits will be obtained. And we need to change dramatically this proportion that we have now. 97.3, this is ridiculous. When we have 25% of the global burden of diseases caused by environmental risk factors, we should have at least 25% of the resources going to uh, primary prevention. I'm sure you will not disagree with that. If somebody uh, increased the funds allocated to uh, environmental epidemiology, I'm sure you will not disagree with that, will you? No, okay, good. <laughs> Even 30? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, partnership opportunities is all about communicating, getting together, and making it much more powerful. 
be convinced that the health sector has a role. Unless we are convinced that we have a role on that and we are not shy when we talk to people outside the scientific community and we try to influence them, we will not be able to utilize our science at the best possible. I have to go very quickly because my 20 minutes went very, very quickly. So the, the conclusions, we need to communicate, and I'm sure you all know the Breathe Life campaign. This is just an example about air pollution and how we do that, and inviting you all to promote this campaign because it takes the science and it uses it to make policy recommendations and to change even at the city level where our probably best ministers of health are, the mayors. Those are the ones that can change a lot. Another opportunity, of course, we need to keep doing science and the best science possible. And, and for WHO, the, the creme de la creme are the guidelines, and those are the ones that are recently produced. Those can take us as far as doing legislation and enforcing countries to apply those guidelines and therefore convincing them to move on a different way. And research priorities. Of course, we need to identify what are those research priorities. I will be very happy to come back, uh, somebody from WHO to come, come, up, come back here and tell you in three years from now on those research priority, what has been achieved with your support. Let's take some examples on, on ambient air pollution. We need to do more on exposure assessment. Certainly, we need to do more on uh, epidemiological studies, on accountability studies, what are those interventions that produce more results? Many of you are part of the global platform on air quality and health. You know that it will be meeting in, in March. I'm, I'm hoping that we will come with a very powerful agenda in terms of research for policy and for uh, having more action. On household air pollution, definitely we have plenty of open issues as well, but more on, on, on understanding what are the health outcomes, CVD, stroke, APO, cognitive impacts, cataract, burn, where are we on all of that? How are we using all of this data to convince more? And on cost benefits and cost efficiencies, effectiveness analysis of clean household energy solutions. We are trying to promote and work very much with those networks of energy and safe and clean and sustainable energy for all to make sure that they link their agenda with the public health one. On climate change, of course, we have plenty of research priorities, although probably one of the most important is to look at this cost uh, co-benefits of the mitigation policies in terms of public health. More we know about that, more we can communicate, and I think more we can use that in the economic considerations to push for this agenda. I will not go into detail on the chemicals and radiation. You will have the presentation, and I understand that my 20 minutes went, and I have so many things to say, but. Uh, uh, sanitation and hygiene. Next week we will be in Copenhagen and uh, Stockholm discussing once again what are their priorities on, on water and sanitation and still struggling with the issue of sanitation, although there are very good examples like in India where they are moving very seriously now on a, on a sanitation campaign. Uh, on children and environmental health, in one month we are launching the children's and air pollution, and I think that will generate, I hope, again, a lot of interest by the media and policymakers. I know I have to finish. And then on housing, the, the housing guidelines has very recently uh, um, launched. And let me finish with this, the, the, the first ever global conference on air pollution and health. From a way or another, you are all involved, I'm sure, and this has to be a before and after in terms of mobilizing the international community. The fact that it's in Geneva, the World Health Organization, giving the message that this is all about health, this is all about public health, no excuses for anyone saying this is not your business, the health community. This is our business because nothing affects more the health of the people than the quality of the air we, we breathe at the moment. And in summary, we have research gaps, we recognize that, but we have enough evidence for, for doing more and scaling up on our science. And let me tell you, 
If people say that I want my country great again, and Macron says I want the planet to be great again, I will like my lungs to be great again. Thank you. So we'll welcome just one question. Please, sir, come to the, the mic. Uh, Thank you. Dan Greenbaum with the Health Effects Institute. Lovely to see you. And, and it's not a surprise that either you or uh, Gina have so much to say because you are doing such great work. I have a question. It's more of a suggestion. And I wonder about an opportunity for ISEE and ISES and WHO. So much of the science, so much of the communication of the science in every country, in every region, is aimed at the environment ministries the EPA, the Ministries of Environment, DG Environment, et cetera. Your constituency is the Ministers of Health. And I wonder if there's an opportunity to make sure everybody in this room who are operating in and doing science locally in many different countries could know who are the key people to whom to communicate that science in the Ministries of Health so that when you walk into the World Health Assembly, uh, you have a pre primed group who says, oh, my local science, scientist in Shanghai or in Chennai or someplace else has shown me that air pollution is a problem or this environment thing is a problem. So is there an opportunity or is there a directory? Are there ways to make that happen? Because I think that's, you've got a great resource here, but I'm not sure everybody knows who their health people are in each country. Wonderful. And it's certainly a very good opportunity. We need to launch a big global alliance, a virtual one, even if Gina doesn't want us to be all the time on our iPhones, but this could be a very good opportunity. We want all of you to reach in others and they created the biggest network ever of people interested on environmental health and environment and health opportunities. So your idea will be explored. We will provide some opportunities for doing it. And more, we work with the ministries of health, empowering them to be able to have conversations with ministers of energy, ministers of uh, economy, that sometimes they don't feel equipped on that. More we are doing on that. So yes, let's go for it. Thank you. I just have one quick message. The breakout sessions are on the second floor and there is no break. So I've seen people already running to the sessions. That's a good thing. Thank you very much again for the two uh, incredible speakers that we've had this morning. Thank you very much, everybody.